Oh.
do for us every day. You're so faithful. Show your love, care, mercy to us every day. Thankful. Thanks for the opportunity we have to come before you today and worship you. In Jesus' name. <coughs> Sounds like uh, we have a lot of blessings going on in here with Albert and all that. And, and I, thank, I thank God for all he's doing in the way of answering prayer at this place. I, uh, I'm having fun. I, Saturday I did my little first grade football team. And boy, that was fun. And, and uh, we don't keep score, but I don't want to brag, but we won 4-1. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we don't keep score. Yeah. Introduction today. Today we're going to look at a uh, a sermon entitled "Let God Be Found True." And um, last week we looked at the first of three accusations Jewish leaders were throwing at Paul. And the first accusation they said is that Paul was teaching against God's chosen people. And what Paul pointed out is God wants the Jew to make a spiritual commitment and not just an ancestral one. Jesus wants our hearts. You know, our outward rituals are important if they testify to the inward commitment to God. And in, in Romans 2, 28 and 29, right to, before we get to chapter 3, I think it says it well. For he is not a Jew, he is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from man, but from God. Uh, Paul, a Jew himself, was not discounting the fact that the Jews were God's chosen people. And as a church, we should never do that either. But with great blessings, he pointed out, comes great responsibilities. Amos. The, in Amos 3, 2, the prophet said, You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. And if you were a Jew, I think you'd want to stop right there at that verse, but you'd have to read on. It says, Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquity. Um, in, in, in the first part of, of uh, Romans, which we studied last time, it says, Then what advantage has a Jew? Or what is the benefit of of circumcision and Paul responds great in every respect first of all they that they were entrusted with the oracles of God through the Jewish people God has given us his word and our Savior Jesus Christ and that brings us to our next um, situation here in Romans 3 and I'm going to have good old Jacob come and read it I uh, didn't have him come up last week but I kind of missed him coming up there. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 3. What then, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy words, and mightest, mightest prevail when thou art judged. Let's pray. You God, I just thank you for your word. I pray, God, you'll bless it as we look at it today. God, you can convict us where we need conviction, encourage us where we need encouragement. And God, the goal is today to go out of this place better equipped to serve you and to know you. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, as I've already pointed out, Paul said that uh, said the blessings of the Jew was a blessing that brought on it, brought with it great responsibility. And Paul, a Jew himself, was not discounting the fact that the Jew was God's co frozen people. As we uh, go through this time of, uh, of Middle East conflict, my prayer is that whoever's in charge here in the United States continues to support Israel, because I think that's what we're called to do. I think there's blessings that come with that. Um, he challenged what was meant when he said that the individual Jew, no matter how pure, 
his lineage to with Abraham or any of the other great saints of the Old Testament was, what Paul was pointing out was the fact that no Jew or anyone else for that matter could claim security in God's promises apart from repentance and personal faith in God. Um, in Isaiah 55, 6, and 7, I, I think it, it illustrates this the best. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. I think this is really critical. You know, have you ever been someplace and you felt the Lord tug on your heart? And you can't say, oh man, I don't know if I want to go up there, or I don't know if I'll pray, or whatever. If you feel God, you seek the Lord while He can be found. And it seems to indicate that, that He won't always be found. If you keep resisting Him and resisting Him, there'll be a time where that becomes easy and you just fall away. It says, seek the Lord while He can be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Some of you came in here with broken hearts, hurts, sicknesses. I, I find that God's the nearest to us when we're going through those things. And, it, and, and if we choose to lean on Him, He won't disappoint us. You know, I, I, I never walk closer to the Lord than when I was on chemotherapy. And I, you know, I know that what I walk. It says, Seek the Lord while He is near, and let the wicked forsake His way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him, him return to the Lord. And He will have compassion on him, and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. You know, I'm too bad for God to love me. You're lying to yourself. God loves you no matter what you've done. He loves you. And, he, and he, He's abundant in His pardons. God's great promises were accompanied by His severest of warnings. I mean, we already talked about Amos 2 where He said, I have chosen you from all the families of the earth. But he also said, therefore, I will punish you for, your for iniquities. Most of the promises in the Bible are conditional. And they're conditional on this. Faith, you have to have faith in God and obedience. And those things produce some really good things for you if you have those two things. A few of the unconditional promises he made, so a lot of them were to the nation of Israel where as a whole. In Genesis uh, 12, 3, we see the Abrahamic covenant. A lot of you know that. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And to that, Paul, in part, uh, agrees with his accusers. We said that in our text, say, what then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Uh, the fact is, no matter how men respond to God's promises, He is absolutely faithful to keep His word. Um, God kept His promise to Israel, even though they had rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. He was, he was not, and because of His holy nation, He could not renege on His promises to them. The accusers were right in contending that God cannot break His word. But in even deeper truth, was that contrary to their thinking of most Jews, salvation was never offered by God on the basis of heritage, ceremony, or good works, or any other basis other than faith. Faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of works, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, that no man may boast. Therefore, Paul's going to ask him this rhetorical question. The fact that the Jew who did not believe forfeited their personal right to God's promised blessings, barred themselves from the inheritance of God's kingdom, will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? You can, tell, you, can, you can resist God and hate God all you want. God loves you. It doesn't change. Nothing changes with God. You know, we, we, we as, I think we as Christians are called that way too. Have you ever been hated by somebody you loved? Or, or, you know, what do you do? You're called to love them. You know, you say, well, that's hard. I didn't say it was easy. But, you know, but, 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 it, but that's what we're called to do. Answering his own question, Paul said this to that. He said, may it never be, which means, of course, God cannot be unfaithful to his promises or in any other way. Paul was saying, rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. The truth is, if every human being that ever lived on this earth declared that God is faithless, God would be found true, and every man who testified against him would be found a liar. 
It's foolish to think that the Lord of heaven and earth might not prevail against the sinful, perverted judgments that either man or Satan could make against us. It really bugs me when people have their faith walked by people who don't believe. You know, I, I look at people that believe and I look at their lives and I think, they got something that those guys don't. And why are people desiring that? How do you apply this to your life today? Well, I think we live in a world that right now is calling God a liar. They're trying to redefine morality, redefine what's right. Um, Paul said in our text, for what if some did not believe? Yeah, it seems to indicate or as a reminder to us all that we live in a world where some don't believe. In fact, uh, I think Paul was being generous actually to his audience. I think we live in a world where many don't believe. And this, is because, this has become a bigger problem because Paul goes on to say their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Now some had inferred that because some don't believe, it leads to them to question their faithfulness in God. And I think that's true. Sometimes Christians, say, or people that say they're Christians, are knocked off their walk with the Lord by people who say, I don't believe that. How can you believe that? Why do you believe that? God, God, God doesn't change, and popular opinion doesn't sway his faithfulness. He loves you, and he desires the best for you. The problem is many believe they have a better way than God. You cannot, we cannot be a nation under God if one of our leading candidates is running on the strength of abortion on demand. I'm sorry, it seems, as, it seems a strong political asset to have that approach. Uh, you'd have to have your head in the sand not to hear the attack ads levied against candidates that vote pro-life. And that just, I, when I see those ads, it just makes me twitch. You know, you know and I, I, I can't stand watching this. I, we have a vice president candidate, very popular, but if he wins, he will done so by virtue of the fact that uh, he put feminine hygiene products in boys' restrooms. He supports gender reassignment surgeries for children. In some cases, despite the parents' approval, he supports the idea of men in women's sport and uh, women in uh, men in women's locker room. I uh, saw so where San Jose State a volleyball team uh, had to forfeit uh, uh, Boise State forfeited to them because they have a transgender athlete on their volleyball. And I think that this is going to happen more and more and more. And it, what seems so obvious, I, you know, my daughter played volleyball. Thank you, Title IX. She got a scholarship and she got to play volleyball. You know, I don't care if I have a 6'4 boy that isn't good enough to play men's volleyball. I'm going to say, oh, that's okay. I'll just try to have him go women's volleyball and they'll give a scholarship. You know, it's just ridiculous. You know, and we, we have become ridiculous. God's not changed. Paul said, may it never be. And this is a text for today because if some do not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. He will, will it? May it never be. Christian young people are going to college right now and coming out with their faith shaken, no longer believing because some progressive teacher taught them that there is no God. And I got news for you. I don't care how smart you think that professor is or believes he is. There is coming a day when you will know God is true and every man at that college that discounted your faith is a proven lie. I believe this is talking to a country that is trying to nullify the faithfulness of God word through popular opinion and a deepening divide in the culture between God and man. Paul is answering the question, has God changed his mind on what is sin or what, is, what he has promised? And he rebuts, he, he, he rebuts, oh, why did I put that word? He gets all fired up and he, and he says, may it never be, you know, may it never be. God hasn't changed his mind on abortion. He recognizes life in the womb. Jeremiah 1, 55, an Old Testament thing, I'd say. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet for to the nation. 
Now, I want you to realize something. I don't want the, the, the Christian church to shut the door to people that have had abortion. Because we have a God of grace. And, 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 and we want them to come here. And we want to give them their grace. The overriding problem is guilt. And what we, well, the only guy I know that can take care of guilt is Jesus Christ. He died to forgive us. And there's enough grace at the cross for anybody in heaven. And I want them, to, I, and so I want people to know we can love them. What happened to those children? Well, God says before the age of accountability, where did they go? To heaven. Okay? God takes care of them. When it comes to gender, men and women, God made man and woman. Back in Genesis 1, 27, he said, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him male and female. He created him. Now, this week I read a medical journal uh, article, and I want to quote it so I don't get it wrong. He said, in today's age, one does not need to fit in with regards to their choices, including their gender identity. Gender is no more regarded as a binary concept where one can either be a male or a female. It, is, it has emerged as a continuum or a spectrum where one can identify themselves as any of the gender identities. And I went on and read this article. I couldn't read it all, but it's kind of plucked me. But it, it identified 72 different genders. Can you imagine? And we wonder why kids are confused today. You know, it's you, you, you Christians' fault. You say male and female, there's 72 of them. They might be a hit that many, whatever, you know. In the world where Christians have been criticized for not trusting science, they're saying the science of the X and the Y chromosome have nothing to do with gender. And, 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 and we, they're telling us we are narrow-minded if you think that way. To those who believe these things are true, now I say, let God be true and every man a lie. And with every sin, I believe God offers grace. And I think, you say, what would you do if somebody came in here that was transgender? I'd welcome them. I'd say, sit right there. I want you to hear what you hear. hear. And, and that. I wouldn't kick them out. Now, I wouldn't have them preach. I wouldn't have them do anything like that. But I would love that. I would love them to come. I don't believe the world's. I don't believe I need the world's approval to know God's ways are true, and anything or anyone that contradicts them is a liar. Uh, we we have left God's God to pursue our own version of morality, and this kind of reminds me. Our, our day in a, in a lot of ways reminds me of a familiar story. And everybody knows you probably watched the Ten Commandments. You know, Charles and Hesson was Moses and led the people of Israel out of Egypt. Well, that was an amazing story. Wasn't it seven plagues, sea split and open? Uh, he supplied manna for him on the trip, you know, a, a, a cloud a day, a pillar of fire at night to, go to, to lead him. All these great people, what do those guys do? Yet, despite God's faithfulness, they continue to lose faith in God. They complain. Uh, and they long to return to a land they once hated. Well, they were in captivity. Oh, man, you know, manna again. Manna burger, manna spam. You know, what is manna, manna, man? And they didn't trust God's leading to the land that flowed in milk and honey. And as a result of those who departed Egypt, you know how many of them entered the land God had promised them at the end? Two. All those people. Two, Caleb and Joseph, uh, excuse me, Joshua, got to enter. The rest died in unbelief in the wilderness out there, never trusting the faithfulness of God. A life without God is an immoral. A life without God is an amoral life. We are so passionate about our politics today, but our faith and our faith is when it comes to our faith, we're indifferent. A country is beyond saving. Our thing, oh, I, well, let me say this is my thing. Our country is beyond saving apart from the revival. I, I really believe that um, we need to return to God as a country. Return to God's word and return to God's church. Many per pastors have refused to preach God's word because it's an offense to the world we live in. 
They water it down. They change it. But listen, pastors, lest you get too puffed up trying to build up your number. It said, let God be found true, though every man be found alive. There is a better way, and God promises it to all of us who turn our lives to Jesus, who put our faith and accept Him as our Lord and Savior, who follow His ways. To those who reject the wisdom of the world for the wisdom of God, they will know God, that God is true and every man is alive. That true, that, <clears throat> that God has promised us, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we open the door to our heart, God promises us that He will come into our hearts and create in us a new person. I don't put my faith in political kings or queens, Republican or Democrat. I put my faith in the one who has the king's heart in his hand. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it where he pleases. Are you ready to give your life to Him? Let's pray. Hey God, I just thank You for this day. God, I confess that You are true and all that don't believe that are alive. God, if there's anybody here who's never given their life to You, just let them pray with me this simple prayer. Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Help me, Lord, to live for You. Thank you for dying for me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen.
us to be faithful to you. So,